Boom, what's up? Mind pump time. Ooh, this is a fun episode. We had Ben Pollock on the show. He's a very strong, very muscular, big, and very smart individual. Um, and in this episode, we talk about bodybuilding versus powerlifting, pros, cons, the carryovers. This guy's really smart, too, so he lays it all out. He's also an open book. We even talk about uh, anabolic steroid use and the differences between powerlifting and bodybuilding. You're going to love this episode, and here's the giveaway, okay, for today. I'm going to give one of you free access to MAPS Powerlift. This is a MAPS program designed for powerlifting. By the way, we created that with Ben Pollock back in the day. In fact, if you buy or get MAPS Powerlift in there, there are videos of Ben coaching you through powerlifting. So it's a great program. One of you gets it for free. Here's how you can get it. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all of those, and if we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and then you'll get free access to MAPS Powerlift. Also, we have a sale going on right now this month, and it's a massive sale. Check this out. It's called the Power Bundle. MAPS Strong, which is a resistance training or strength training program that's strongman inspired. So some unconventional lifts. You develop an incredible posterior chain, back and butt. Everybody loves this program. Very popular. And we combine that with MAPS Power Lift, which is the, the program we created with Ben Pollock. It's a powerlifting inspired workout program. Get your bench, your deadlift, and your squat to new levels, okay? Both programs, if you got them normally without the sale, would cost you 300 bucks. Right now, get them both. The Power Bundle, $79.99. Huge discount. If you're interested and you want to sign up, head over to mapsmarch.com. Once again, it's mapsmarch.com. All right, here comes the show. I'm actually really excited to to have you back in the studio. We, I didn't realize that it has been over over three years because that was the Austin trip. I know we did, we did the program with you, but we didn't do a podcast. So it's been since Austin, and I know that's at least three or four years. And so a lot has happened since then, and I'm really excited to, to hang out, dude. It's good to see yeah, you. Me too. Yeah, 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 yeah. you know you're in a, you're in a unique uh, position. I, I I've always liked finding people like you because I have a lot of questions around uh, kind of similarities and differences between different training method you know methodologies and you were a highly competitive power lifter who then went into bodybuilding and a lot of similarities obviously both lift weights you know getting stronger building muscle but very different competition wise there's differences in how you train and diet and all that stuff and I'd love to kind of dive in a little into that what you saw the differences were and how it felt and Maybe start with why. Why did you switch from a you know powerlifting where you did have a great career into the sport of bodybuilding, which is uh, a lot different in terms of the judging and competition? Yeah, so that's actually an easy question for me because it was a very it was a decision I struggled over for a long time. So when I finally made the switch, I was very clear that this is what I was going to do. So it was about about a full year that I was trying to stay one eighty one for powerlifting because I wanted to total two thousand at that weight class and i was before that i was walking around around 215 right so that's more of a cut than i was capable of doing the biggest cut i ever did um my walk around weight was like 205 to 181 now i would blow it up higher than that in the off season and stuff like that but then you know kind of died down closer to the show and uh i guess i did one cut that was bigger than that but that was a bad experience so trying to stay that light i was eating almost nothing which i, I could deal with that right like that's just discipline but because I was trying to stay that light, I ended up getting hurt over and over and over again. It was bad to the point where I'd be walking in the gym cramping up before I even started lifting. Oh. And I'd have to, actually have to warm up for half an hour so the cramps would go away. Oh, interesting. And so whether it was like a little minor ache and pain or something like more major that was holding me back, it just kept happening over and over and over again. So I was training for the U.S. Open in, I believe it was 2019. And training was actually going really well. I was walking around. It was about 200, uh, two, 201, something like that. So actually a relatively easy cut to 181. And uh, I had hit a 760 squat in training, uh, pulling about the same. All my lifts were going really well. And I ended up developing tendonitis in my knees. That was both knees. So bad I couldn't even walk upstairs or anything. And I had to drop the meat for that. I ended up getting cortisone injection one. It went away, but uh, it, it was just, I, I had really pushed hard for that prep mentally. And after that, I was like, I, I just can't keep, keep this up. I got to give my body a break. So um, that's the, that was the point when I started uh, training 
training. I was still doing powerlifting training, but my goal shifted towards bodybuilding. Now, what was it about bodybuilding that attracted you in terms of, because you're injured and what, was it just that, okay, now I can allow my body to grow or that I don't have to train as heavy? Like, what was it that attracted you? It was, I, I'm, I'm somebody who has to have a goal. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have a goal. It's not that I'm not going to train hard. It's not that I'm not going to follow my diet. I'll just kind of go nuts. Like, mm -hmm. I need something to push for. So I had a goal that would still allow me to train in a way that was intense, in a way that was, you know, kind of uh, directed at something, not just training for the enjoyment of it. And I could train a little bit lighter, so I wasn't going to beat myself up as much. But I, I really, at first, I was not uh, invested in the bodybuilding world at all. I really just wanted to have that goal that would be something external that I could work towards that wouldn't beat me up as much. Now, did you have any concerns with, because the I, one of the biggest differences that I see in powerlifting and in bodybuilding is, and powerlifting, you either lift the weight you don't. So you win or you lose. It's objective. There's no arguments. I mean, there could be arguments on, I guess, the way that they judge a lift. But it's not a subjective sport like bodybuilding where you're on stage and then someone says you look better than the other guy. <laughs> so was there any concerns with, with that at all? Or Well, no, because when I was starting out, I didn't realize that, right? And so I thought, well, this is essentially the same as a weight class competition. All I have to do is be the biggest guy on stage, so I'll do another crazy water Wait a minute, you really thought that? You really I thought really that was super thought objective? That. I really <laughs> thought that. And... So I remember that. that I remember the. All. I remember the phone call that he called me after that show, and I remember like having to talk him off. He's ready to rip yep. his faces off. I'm like, bro, calm down, relax. This is this is he part of it. About your first, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's what you experienced. So, so you went in there thinking, oh, it's just objective. I'm going to be bigger, more ripped, and I'll yep. win. And and then you like, how did you feel when you figured out that's not quite how it is? Uh, well, I was so hungry at that point that I was I didn't feel anything. So hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. I think after that show, I. Ate for like eight hours not eight hours it was like three or four hours just straight shoving my face just hunger would not go away oh <laughs> man terrible. what was the prep like for because okay so here's another big difference and these are all coming to me now as i think about it as you're leading up to a powerlifting competition your goal is to be as strong and aggressive and energetic as possible yep bodybuilding it's like how close to death can I get without they call, actually dying? They call Walking Dead men is what they call mm -hmm. them. That that must have been weird for you. Like, what was the how was the prep for bodybuilding versus powerlifting? So I didn't mind. Like, I kind of like I like pushing myself, right? right? So the fact that I was feeling like shit, that I could kind of at least embrace. Like, this is a challenge. Like, yeah. I, I can wrap my head around that. What I couldn't wrap my head around was the fact that you're supposed to get on stage and just be calm and enjoying yourself. And I'm like. I'm supposed to be fired up. Like I'm supposed to be snorting ammonia. I'm supposed to be like screaming <laughs> so that it, I got off stage and I was like, I didn't even do anything. Like what, what was the last 12 weeks for? Like to just walk across the stage. I could have done that at the start of prep. That was really weird for me. That took me a long time to C circling back to the training. Um, I know that, that this part could get very nuanced and we don't have to get in crazy detail, but I am a little curious, like, what were some of the major shifts as far as the training from shift lifting wise? Like, uh, did you dramatically change the programming completely? I mean, did you, what was the focus like and what did you kind of get rid of that you were doing before? Well, so at first I was pretty misguided because, so again, I wasn't super invested in bodybuilding itself. Right. And so I saw it as an excuse to let myself train more often. Right. Cause I was, now I can do a body part split so I can do push pull legs instead of having to do you know, squat and deadlift on the same day. So I can put in five or six training days and that's, it's not like your recovery is any better because you're training for something different. Mm -hmm. Right. So that didn't go that well. Um, once I tried, once I started to get a little bit more familiar with what the training was supposed to be like, uh, then it got, it, it was really pretty simple, right? It was including more isolation work. It was including more direct arm training, more direct shoulder training. Um, but it was still primarily a powerlifting program. Like, I just enjoyed the heavy lifting too much to kind of cut that out completely. Yeah. Even though I don't think it was super beneficial for me. Yeah. I remember we interviewed um, Stan Efforting and he was somebody that kind of did that as well. Right. And he said one of the biggest challenges for him was changing from like maximizing biomechanics, leverage and technique for a lift versus making it feel harder. Yes. And feeling it in the muscles more and doing the, you know, maybe more reps or whatever. Did you have a tough time, transitioning from you know i'm i'm squatting 600 pounds to i need to squat 315 and just really feel it in my quads type of deal yes i, I it was definitely very mentally challenging physically i don't think it was that challenging for most of my body parts because for 
especially for my back and legs, I already had a pretty strong mind muscle connection, right? So from a physical standpoint, that was pretty easy. It was definitely hard to get over the ego aspect of, okay, we're going to knock the weights down and this is still supposed to be productive training for the, for the pressing muscles in particular, right? So my, my chest, my shoulders, my triceps, bench always held me back in, in powerlifting. Those muscles helped me back in, in bodybuilding. It was still kind of a thing where I had to put in a lot of time and a lot of patience and really almost start from square one, trying to figure out exactly what you're saying. Okay. We're going to try and feel the muscle actually working. We're not just trying to move the weight. Uh, and then trying to isolate those individual muscle groups too, pretty difficult for me because my shoulders have been beat up my entire powerlifting career. And if you don't have good mobility, it's very, very difficult to put yourself in positions where you can really get that mind muscle connection. Where did you notice the lack of mobility? Was it just the full extension overhead and anything overhead, man, not just full extension, wow. but yeah, any type of vertical pressing was really, really difficult for me. Um, even incline pressing was really, really difficult. Wow. Um, and I had to do a lot of mobility work to kind of get over that. And it would kind of manifest itself outside of just pressing work, right? Like when I was gaining all that weight, I couldn't even get under a squat bar. My mobility got so bad because I had added all that muscle, but mm. I hadn't added, I hadn't built the flexibility to go with it. Um, so that, that was actually really, really difficult. Were there any like specific exercises that you added into your routine that you saw like massive benefit from, like that you weren't really doing before? Um, definitely isolation work from not isolation work but um direct back training upper back training because i was only doing deadlifts and wait a minute hold on so go, be, when you were a power lifter you didn't do a lot of pull-ups pull downs I rows love, i love tables. that because you're you're an example i use all the time when i get in this argument there's this and i'm sure you've seen this there's some trainers uh that yeah, are, deadlift is not a back exercise. yeah that's right and say deadlifting is not a back exercise. and i always point exercise. to your your instagram as an example and i actually didn't know you were doing any i'm just like here's a guy who i know mostly only deadlifts and look the fuck at his back so tell me it's not for your back so i don't want to say never because i would throw it in at the end of the workout randomly but it was never programmed right it would be like oh i'm bored i have some time i still have some energy let me do some lap pull downs mm -hmm. something like that there was never any wow. rhyme or reason to it wow um, and same with so isolation work for my shoulders never messed with like lateral raises or anything like that those were probably the biggest thing because once i started actually using my shoulders a lot of that pain went away mm. surprise oh right? interesting like, so you actually had a correctional uh aspect from oh, the bodybuilding bet. type movements yes um yeah and for a long time i still couldn't do lateral raises right i'd have to find other types of shoulder training that i could do without pain um and once i finally uh brett wilkin who's competing at the arnold next week he showed me how to do lateral raises in a way that i could without pain and that made a huge difference now one thing that i noticed that's different with uh i guess training for strength specific type stuff versus just hypertrophy is strength specific type stuff you tend to do a lot of sets of one exercise or two exercises so i might do 10 sets of squats because that's the exercise that I'm trying to get strongest in versus bodybuilding where I'm doing a lot of different exercises, maybe less sets per exercise, but just, did you do that? Were you just throwing, like maybe doing less of your other, you know, traditional lifts and doing just more of other stuff? I was definitely doing less of the squat bench and deadlift, right? Because there's only so much stimulation you can get for your whole body with those three. Right. Lifts. Um, but I definitely wasn't doing as many exercises as I think you'd find in a traditional bodybuilding program. Not because I think that's wrong, but because I couldn't wrap my head around okay, if I'm doing three different types of rows, how am I going to know whether all three of these are progressing or if I'm just exhausting myself in the first one mm -hmm. so I have nothing left on the third one? That kind of messed with my head because like you mentioned earlier, bodybuilding is really subjective. So if I didn't have those objective markers of, okay, I'm progressing in the gym, I, I just it, it really got to me. Mentally. Yeah, because I can imagine that, you know, when you're, and it's hard, I guess this is good to talk about for people listening. When you're training for performance, right, or powerlifting, which is strength, Mentally speaking, it's a different feel in the gym. Yes. It's about leverage and strength and technique and energy. Whereas a bodybuilder, it's like feel the pump, feel the muscle. Am I getting it tired? And the weights are really just a means to an end. It doesn't matter how heavy or light it is as long as you're... So that's such a different... I know it sounds easy talking about it, but that must have been a really hard transition mentally, just the way you worked out. Yeah, um, and I'm still not really great at it because I'm... I mean, I'm probably addicted to the dopamine rush at this point, right? Mm. But those big lifts where you kind of get that um, fight or flight response right before you get under the bar, that to me is really fun. Being in that moment and being yeah. like, okay, got to calm myself down so that I can do this properly. I really enjoy that. The bodybuilding is more meditative where it's like, okay, this is going to be a long totally. process and you need to be focused the entire 
90 minutes that you're training, yeah. that, that takes a different type of mental state. Yeah. Now, the pump is, um, that's a big bigger focus on bodybuilding and powerlifting. I don't think powerlifters care if they get pumped or not. Were you getting? Were you seeing different levels of that in and how it felt in training? Yeah, that had to been big cool. time, very cool, right? <laughs> very cool. Uh, yeah, and I mean that goes hand in hand with nutrition, right? If you're eating obviously any carbs for powerlifting, so adding both those in the different training, the different nutrition, the pumps were insane, man, to the point where they'd be like painful in a fun way. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Cool. yeah, cause you don't want that in powerlifting. You don't want to power a painful pump where you can't do your lifting. There's, anymore. you know, in some circumstances I will give my guy, my, the powerlifters I coach, I'll give them uh, exercises where I want to get them, get where I want them to get a pump, but it's either going to be the two, two times that would be is they're trying to get over some type of joint pain. Right. Mm -hmm. And I feel mm -hmm. like the blood flow is beneficial for that. Or they have uh, a fault in their technique where they're really not using a certain muscle group. And right? you want them so, to feel it. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly how it uh, used to apply. Now, what about the the development in your physique? Because there's a lot of criticisms with powerlifting and how it develops your physique versus bodybuilding. For example, powerlifter might have a thick, you know, deep back, but maybe the lats aren't very developed, or the arms aren't going to match, you know, the rest of the body, or you may have good quads, maybe hamstrings might not, maybe not so much, you know, that type of stuff. Or maybe, or here's a big one, the blocky waist, right? Versus the small waist on bodybuilding. Did you run into any of these types of issues with your physique as you? Absolutely. And again, that was an, another big mental challenge because it's a chicken and egg thing, right? Are you gravitating towards powerlifting because you have this structure that's better to lift? Ah, heavy that's weights? a great question. Or did powerlifting develop this structure for you? I still don't know because I took physique pictures when I was powerlifting, right? But I'd always be trying to get the perfect angle. They weren't progress pictures like you would do for check-ins yeah. for bodybuilding. So I have no idea. Um, now, I will say definitely the extremities in particular, right? The arms, the shoulders, the calves, those things way underdeveloped in powerlifting. You just don't train them that much. Mm -hmm. Even the lats, I saw you know pretty big difference from adding in that that back work other than deadlifts. Um, so I definitely think there's a, an aspect to it, but – you know, you're going to get a lot of quad growth from squats. You're yep. going to get a lot of back development. You're going to get a lot of pec development from benching. So it, it's, I don't have a good answer for you, but I do know that a lot of the power lifters I look at have a far different shape, even given how strong they are in those lifts than you would expect. You look at a bodybuilder who can do the same amount of weight. They're going to be massively bigger and they yeah. have different, a different look to their physique. They're going to have more capped shoulders, they're going to have rounder pecs. They're going to have thicker arms. Yeah. Sort of and here's something that's hard to explain that um, I've seen. And I remember first reading about this years ago. I remember Arnold wrote about this in, it's probably a, 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 in the seventies. And the article was something about how adding powerlifting training develops a more dense granite look to the physique versus always doing bodybuilding, which is more of this kind of round, full, you know, bubbly look to the body. Now, what's interesting is when I see powerlifters convert to bodybuilding, it seems to prove true. You definitely have the granite hard look and not the bubbly flex wheeler, you know, look with the muscles. Is that is that something that is you guys talk about? You, have you observed that yourself? Definitely observed it. I've also I've tried to look into it from, you know, research perspectives. Yeah. I haven't found a lot that's going to support that. But it, it seems to be true, man. It definitely seems like the guys who train, who incorporate a lot of you know, kind of pumping work, for lack of a better term, they do have kind of that bubble, bubblier look to them. Again, there you got you got to wonder: Are they bodybuilders because they had that naturally? Is that something they developed through their training? Is it something related to the diet where their their carbohydrate intake means they're going to store more glycogen, so they're going to have that fuller look? I don't know. Yeah. I believe that has to do more with training. Personally, myself, I remember- I've seen the change in myself. I was the opposite, yeah. right? So I actually started as a young kid training like a bodybuilder. It wasn't until I got older that I start incorporating more powerlifting. And the biggest difference that I noticed, I mean, there's a lot of different things, but one of the things I, I always struggled with as a young guy lifting and training for hypertrophy for the pump all the time is I looked great in the gym. But then when I, as soon as I, two hours later, I would feel like it deflated all the way back to like a normal looking physique. When I started to incorporate powerlifting and, and training really heavy, I didn't feel like I aired up as much, but I felt like that muscle, that muscle look 
uh, stayed on me throughout the day, if that makes sense. Yes. Like I looked, I looked more muscular when I was flat and not pumped up. Yep. Um, so maybe it wasn't as extreme looking, but then I built like this muscle that stuck on me. It's just, it's hard for me to explain to someone who hasn't experienced it because there isn't any science to really support what we're saying, but I've seen it in, in several friends of mine that have experienced it on, in both directions. I've experienced myself and I really believe that that has more to do, in my opinion, with the training than the body type. The other one I think has more to do with the body type. I do believe that when you see someone who has kind of like boxier hips or like that, and they're also badass powerlifters, I think that- That helps. That, that helps. I think that's half of what makes them really good at that. Just Absolutely. like you see, like, a, like I get this question a lot with um, uh, female CrossFit athletes. Like a lot of times girls are afraid to train some of those lifts because they're like, oh, all the girls in CrossFit have these really boxy hips. And it's, I think that's, they are good at CrossFit because they have those hips, not those hips gave them. Yeah. You and know, then you get the weird anomalies like Ronnie Coleman, who had a really small waist and, you know, deadlifting 800 pounds yep. for reps. <laughs> so that's, that's, that there's stuff like that that happens. Yeah. What about the stamina stuff? Because um, I've trained both ways and transitioning from, Lots of sets, lots of rest, low reps to, you know, now I'm doing 12, 15 reps and squats and lunges and rest is a lot shorter. It's like, uh, man, the stamina is just, the, endurance, the lack of endurance I have transitioning to that was just ridiculous. Did you find that for yourself? Yeah. And again, I, I put on all that size really quickly, right? So it was hard for me to walk upstairs for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely a lot different. And I think part of uh, the transition was figuring out, okay, how can I make it so that I can push myself really, really hard, push my muscles really, really hard without just having my lungs being the limiting factor. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you, what'd you end up doing or did it just take time? It took time. Time was the big one. Um, but it was also, there was some degree of movement selection and then there are other strategies you can use, right? Like supersetting muscles that aren't antagonistic, you know, like doing chins and squats together. You can yeah. get more work done in the same period of time or, um, doing a lot of cardio helped do you do you what are the i guess advantages you think you had competing at the level you did in powerlifting and going to bodybuilding versus the other people who are just pure bodybuilders i i think the biggest thing was i had already put in a lot of time weight training right like because mm. yeah i was starting out from ground zero in bodybuilding but i had still developed a lot of muscle from all that powerlifting and so that gave me kind of a head start uh the things that um having the knowledge of and i, I don't want to say biomechanics because i don't have a degree in that or anything but having that kinesthetic awareness that i built through learning to squat and deadlift and bench and have all my muscle muscle groups work kind of synergistically mm. that definitely helped me to learn how to because posing is a lot like that right like your body has to move as one unit even though in the gym when you're training for bodybuilding you want to isolate those muscle groups it's different when you're on stage when you're actually performing. So I think I, it helped in that regard. I also think a huge advantage uh, that you had too was we, and we talk about this on the show a lot. Some of the best programming out there comes from powerlifting, like because it has it's those objective. Yeah, and yes. and and you have to be seeing uh, this the progress on weight on the bar. So you have to be very smart the way you program. Um, and I think that there's not as much of that in bodybuilding. Um, Absolutely, agree. I think bodybuilding is uh, a lot of a lot of bodybuilder people who bodybuild kind of fool themselves because it, yeah, it feels this way, it feels that way. It's hard to fool yourself when you're powerlifting or Olympic lifting because well, are you stronger? It's either yes or no. So I, I could see that as an advantage as well. Um, I absolutely agree. I've also, um, one of the guys I work with, Mike Teixeira, who's a great powerlifting coach, one of the best powerlifting coaches out there, he made the really good point that in powerlifting, the training drives the progress. In bodybuilding, to a large extent, the food and the drugs drive the progress. Mm -hmm. right? Totally. So the weight on the bar increasing to some degree can be just a result of the fact that you're eating more and you're taking anabolics. Right. Oh, right. well, that's interesting. Now, what about the camaraderie? Like, it, you know, I, is it a different feel? Oh yeah, did you competing like, did with you like powerlifters versus by like what's the difference? More than the other? That is a great question. So I actually, it was so hard for me at first. It was so hard for me because I really, you know, there's the stereotype of the you know the douchebag bodybuilder who's posing in the mirror and everything. Yeah. And I I didn't want to be part of that crowd. <laughs> I actually worked with a sports psychologist uh, because it was like it was bothering me, and I was like I, I really want to train with my powerlifting friends at the powerlifting gym, even though I'm going to be competing in this. And she's like, well, you know, challenge yourself to to make new friends, essentially. And I had the advantage of, okay, I already have a pretty big following on social media, so people were were more likely to talk to me, and that made it really easy. And 
Um, in hindsight, what, probably the single coolest thing about bodybuilding is that I did make so many new friends because um, everybody that I don't, I don't think that stereotype holds true at all. All the bodybuilders I've met have been really, really cool, really, really supportive of each other um, and really not egotistical at all. So, What about competition day? Like how different is that? Everybody's dead on competition. <laughs> <I was talking. laughs> Everybody's sitting there staring into space being like, I just want to get this over and eat. And, and powerlifting is not like that? In powerlifting, I think everybody's kind of like – they're amped up, but there's there's a lot of camaraderie there that you you don't get on stage because you have to be warming up on the same bar in the same back room. Like you're trying to help each other out, you're trying to make sure everything goes smoothly. Mm -hmm. You've got people volunteering to help you, and you have that in bodybuilding too. But there's a lot less work to do in bodybuilding. You're saying, okay, guys, it's time to pump up. Versus, okay, like what do you need for your next attempt? Who's going when? You have this long until you need to be on the platform. There, there's a lot more logistical stuff that goes on, and I think that means people are going to be helping themselves. Yeah, helping now it seems more. like uh, you, in terms of like going from powerlifting to bodybuilding, there are some advantages there, but it doesn't seem like there's any advantages if you start off as a bodybuilder and switch over to powerlifting. What would those be, if you could think? I think that the volume of training that bodybuilders do for their upper body really seems to carry over well to the bench press. Bodybuilders almost universally seem to have really impressive bench presses. Hmm. Um, but that that would be kind of like the, the big one. Um, and then I think also powerlifters tend to neglect hypertrophy training. Um, and if they do, it's, it's almost, if they do it at all, it tends to be more of an afterthought, especially right now, it seems kind of popular to just do squat bench and deadlift. And I think that is selling most lifters short. I definitely think there's advantage to including those, uh, lifts in hindsight, I'm saying that. Now right, you mentioned but. too, with your shoulders, like how you notice, like, uh, you know, that lockout and like you, that, that definitely benefited you, your overall uh, performance physique like what about your legs like did you do any split stance training did you do anything i did regard? a little bit but i definitely think genetic wise my legs were pretty good to begin with mm -hmm. um so i didn't add a whole lot um one thing that i had to add i added in leg extensions and the reason was one of my first posing classes was with uh, Derek lunsford who's the 212 mr olympia now and we're uh, in the posing room and he's trying to teach me how to do uh, an ab and thigh pose. And he's trying to get me to um, get the upper quads to separate. Mm. But I just, I can't, can't, I don't, I don't understand what he's telling me. You didn't me. have the control. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he's like, so, do you do any leg extensions? I'm like, I kind of scoff. I'm like, I don't do leg extensions. Like, I do squats. <laughs> yeah. Were you, like, you going to have me do the hip abduction just, machine next? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, well, dude, you got to start doing leg extensions. At the top, you're really trying to feel that kind of squeeze where you've got the, the hip flex, but yeah, know, the, the knee extended. So I started doing them. And of course he's right. He's Mr. Olympia. He knows what he's talking about. Um, but when you do those sorts of movements that are going to mimic what the positions you're in and on stage it really helps a lot to develop that control. Yeah. You know, if it's fun, if you don't mind, I'll be a little objective about your physique when you first transition. Please. I, I, I didn't need to know you were a power lifter to see on stage when you were ripped and posing that you were a power lifter. Now, of course there's the like, okay, I, you know, power lifters don't work their arms as much and all this stuff. But one thing is when you turned around and your back dwarfed a lot of the other bodybuilders. Now, I could see the lat area, you know, obviously you probably didn't do a lot of lat work, but the thickness and development in your back dwarfed other other bodybuilders. And I, I typically see that with power lifters who transition into bodybuilding. And my best, uh, I guess, explanation is the deadlifts. They just, bodybuilders don't deadlift. And there's this argument about whether or not deadlifts are good for bodybuilding. And what. Do you think bodybuilders should all deadlift? I don't know if they all need a deadlift, but yes, I think most bodybuilders should absolutely be deadlifting. I think it should be. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be back-specific training, right? Mm. Some people are going to have leverages where their deadlift is going to be a, more of a lower body lift. And if they want to incorporate that on their leg day, I think that's fine. It's still going to have carryover to the back development. Honestly, when I'm looking at bodybuilding programming, instead of coming from a body part standpoint, I'm coming from a movement pattern standpoint. Sure. So I'm going to tell any bodybuilder you need to have a hinge in your program if it's a deadlift if it's an rdl if it's you know some other type of hinging movement that you can feel where your erectors and lats and glutes and posterior chain are Work all together. engaged yeah. you're good yeah that makes a big difference are, were there any are there any exercises or things that you see yourself forever incorporating now in your training that wasn't there before like were there things that bodybuilding highlighted or showed you that's a good question so absolutely calf training calf training i think every single powerlifter needs to be doing that because 
if you're training your calves through a full range of motion, you're going to develop a lot of dorsiflexion. You're going to develop comfort having your calf under load. And when you're in the bottom of the squat, that's exactly what's happening. And I see a lot of power lifters who develop ankle or knee injuries and they never do any calf training. And I think if they did, they would have a lot fewer problems. That so think. highlights something we just talked about on the show. I was telling the guys yeah. um, when I worked on my squat depth, right? I had before I had a really short, I could barely break 90 degrees, had poor ankle mobility. I put a lot of work in that and now I comfortably can sit ass to grass in my squat. One of the side effects of that that I would not have seen coming was I developed my calves more from that. It's, and that's such a great point. I think a lot of people neglect that. Any other ones besides that? So calf training for sure. So for me in particular, not so much of an issue because I, you know, I think I do genetically have pretty good leg development but one of the things that i learned uh, and i learned this training at mi40 uh was that a lot of power lifters seem to have very weak upper hamstrings and so i think a hamstring curl like a lying hamstring curl oh or, the leg bicep see, yeah yeah because you don't do anything for yep. that it's all hip hinging yes and it's shocking to me you can put a power lifter who can squat 800 pounds you can put them on a leg curl and you can try to have them use 50 pounds just at that end range, right? Just where they're really trying to get that upper hamstring engaged and they can't do it. They'll just kind of, you know, use momentum through that part of the lift. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think I would definitely incorporate in more programming, maybe not for myself, but in general. Now, did uh, you notice any carryovers to your deadlift from strengthening, from doing leg curls? The, it's It's been pretty cool that I, and I was telling Adam this before we started recording, um, even though I haven't specifically been training for a heavy deadlift, it seems like my deadlift strength has really increased since I've started bodybuilding. What about your biceps? Because uh, I've, I, you know, I have powerlifter friends and they don't like to train their biceps. What do I need biceps for? Whatever. And then, you know, I had one friend who started training his biceps and was like, "I feel more stable in the deadlift with stronger bicep." Did you notice anything from that, or is it just a show muscle? So, <laughs> I had, I, I've had problems with my deadlift grip. Because, so I, I gained a lot of weight, right? Yeah. My hands got a lot bigger, uh, and so I have a hard time holding on to the bar. Oh, that makes Before, sense. I pulled, pulled hook grip, and now that I'm bigger, my movement pattern is a little bit different. It's very difficult for me with a conventional stance to pull in a straight line. And with a hook grip, if you're pushing the bar away from me even a little bit, the bar's going to spin, and you're going to lose that. Oh, yeah. A oh, lot of the, the I, don't, I don't know the physics term, but yeah. it's going to be a lot harder to hold on to the bar. Um, so I can pull sumo fine. Because then I do have a straight movement pattern, sure. but I don't know whether uh, the bicep training has helped my grip strength at all. Yeah, that's that, that makes a lot. So, so do you have to go alternate? Um, no. So I've tried that. I tried hook grip. Um, the only thing that I found that consistently works is a sumo stance uh, with a hook grip. And that's really one of the reasons that I haven't competed seriously in powerlifting since I started bodybuilding was I, I haven't really figured out how to fix my mm. grip issues. So I'm going to ask you maybe a, a, an offensive question to a powerlifter, but what about what about wrist straps? Why not use wrist straps in your, you know, uh, well, straps on your... I do, but okay, it's good. not allowed in competition. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. That's what I mean. If, I, it, I, I, if I, it were allowed in a meet, 100%. I'd be out there. 100%. <laughs> totally. All right, well, let's get into the to the diet side because this is something, and this makes perfect sense. You compete as a powerlifter in a weight class. Yep. You could not allow your body to get too heavy. So you, as a bodybuilder, which which people, when they picture, if you just say powerlifter versus bodybuilder, people tend to think the reverse. Oh, powerlifters eat whatever they want, which is true if you're at the top weight class and you have there's no more limit. But if you're in a weight class, you can't do that. You have to keep your weight down. Whereas in bodybuilding, you know, if you're on stage and you're lean, if you have more muscle, I guess the better, right? So yep. what was that like? And, you know, it, what were you eating before and how did you change that? Dude, I was eating so little. When I was trying to stay 181, like I was talking about that last year in powerlifting, I was eating something like 1,800 calories a day. Wow. And Holy I'm, cow. I'm squatting and deadlift 700 pounds of reps so week crazy, in and week dude. out. I, I still look back. I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? And how did I do that? Because it's just, it seems even more terrible in hindsight. Um, so I was, there was at one point where I was eating like six bags of spinach a day because it's, it's low in calories, yeah. but higher in, higher in uh, food volume, just so that I wouldn't be like feeling starving all day long. My potassium from all that spinach was like, it got elevated and high, high potassium puts you at risk of heart attacks. So it's like, <laughs> it was scary. Um, so when I actually started eating uh, for bodybuilding, I was able to put on a lot of size really quickly. Um, but I think we talked about this before the show too, the gut health issues. It's like, it's really uncomfortable trying to eat that much food, um, especially all those carbohydrates that I wasn't used to. And, you know, they taste good, but you don't really feel good afterwards. You feel kind of sluggish. So where did you, did you just go from 1800 to 5,000? Did you have to slowly... 
So my first prep was for classic physique, so I really wasn't eating anymore, and I ended up on stage at 184. But yes, after that, when I started training actually for bodybuilding, I went straight from, I, I can't remember how many, it was slightly more because I was doing more activity for bodybuilding, but I went straight from that to over 5,000 a day. Wow. Holy cow. And how did you feel? I, I, dude, at that point, I was so hungry after dieting for so long that like I was still hungry on that. That I was, it was probably four or five months of eating that food. Plus volume. a new training stimulus and yep. everything too. So your it, body was just. It took a it long up. time until my body was like, okay, we've had enough food. And how did you? How did you, you had to break it up in a, in a meal throughout the oh, day. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah. Um, now, now looking that you went from one extreme to the other with the weight and the food, what would you say? If, like if, if we weren't competing at all in anything, if we were just looking for general health, where do you think like your calorie intake would, and weight would look like? I'm not going to lie. I talk, think about that a lot because I really want to <laughs> be to the point where I just want to feel good, right? Yeah. Like I don't want to feel so uncomfortably huge. I don't want to be like starving all the time. So I think for me, it would probably be around 215, 220. Yeah. Um, when I was competing at 198 in powerlifting, I was pretty comfortable. Yeah. Didn't have to do those extreme weight cuts. Um, was eating an amount that, you know, kind of felt right. I think for me, calories would probably be around 3,500 because so I'm still going to train. I love training. Mm -hmm. I don't want to back right, off right. on that, but, um, yeah, probably, probably a good 30 pounds less than I weigh right now. And probably about 30% fewer calories. So let's see your, what was your body? You were walking around. You said like what? 210 when you were a power lifter? When I was competing in, uh, competing at 198, I was walking around 215, 215. And then for 181, it was 205, 210. Okay. So, and then bodybuilding, where are you hitting your, you've obviously put on a lot of size. What, what do you weigh in the off season? What do you compete at? The highest I've ever weighed in on the off season was 272. Wow. And my so hold on. That's a 60 pound, essentially 60 pounds heavier. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then when you, so and you don't, by the way, uh, people don't, don't follow your Instagram. You always have abs. I've never seen you have not have abs. So it's not like you're 270 fat. No, I mean, that's just genetic. It's not like I, you know, do anything special for that. But yeah, um, I, I always stay pretty lean. That's not hard at all. It's, it's still uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if it's muscle or fat, yeah. right? Like it doesn't feel good. Such to a good that point, much. you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so 272 is the absolute highest point in the off season. My stage weight for my last show was 246. Wow. Okay. So you so the difference you're literally lean body mass wise. Uh, it's probably more than this because you were obviously more shredded on bodybuilding stage, but it's at least fifty pounds. Yep. How fast did that come on? Um, so I put on most of that size. I think in the first eight months or so, like Whoa, it's right when I started eating. What is that per pumped. month? It's like that's like almost. That's like seven, eight pounds a month. Honestly, a lot of, so a lot of it was like water retention, right? Sure. But like the first three months I put on something like, it had to be something like 60 pounds in the first three months. Water, right? Like including all the muscle. Okay. Half of it. You're still 30 yeah. pounds of, of muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, uh, it was insane. Like the, I'd take my socks off and my feet would, you know, had that edema. Yeah. It, it was crazy. Um, so most of it was all at once. And then it took me a long time because I, I, don't remember if we were on air when I said this, but like hard to walk upstairs and stuff. Mm. So I had to stay there until I kind of like got comfortable. And that was around the 240 range. Then I had another big push and got from there to about 270. Uh, and that's kind of been where I've, I've stalled out. Just getting past that is. Now, is even though you're intimidating. switching over to the bodybuilding type training, I got to imagine you putting on that much muscle, that much weight, you're also seeing strength gains too. Yeah, it's interesting because they haven't been as large as you would expect. And a lot of that, I think, is because your leverage has changed so much. Sure. When I was competing in powerlifting at the lower weight classes, my technique was weird. I don't think there was, from a technical standpoint, I think it was sound, but it looked very uncomfortable. It looked very unconventional um, because I had to work around my leverages. So I developed these movement patterns that worked for me when I was that size, but they don't work anymore. So I had to change those. Didn't you have more of a forward bend in your squat when a, you were lighter yeah. versus now you look more upright? Way more, way more. Because there was almost no hip engagement in my old squat. It was all quad. Mm. Um, and I just didn't have the hip musculature to support that weight. Mm. So now that I do, I can use my hips. And it does seem to have made a pretty big difference in, in my squat. I don't think that I haven't like push, push my squat, but I think if I did, I could probably get to 800 and sleeves. That has like to that. be so weird to try. I mean, that's like taking, to put that in perspective, it's imagine like putting like on a, a, new body. a Tiger Woods or someone who's been swinging a golf club the same way for their whole career as a professional. And then all of a sudden we're, you know, add 15, 20 pounds to your body and we're going to swing different. Like, well, if, okay. So to give you an crazy, to give an example, it's like when you see a kid grow, like go through their teenage years and they grow really fast and then they move awkwardly. Yep. They're not used to their body. 
And I, I experienced this in when I competed in jujitsu. I put on 15 pounds, took a couple months, few months off, went back. My technique was off. Yeah. And it was not because I don't remember the technique, it's because I didn't know how to use my body. Yes. With it. And that was 15 pounds. So going to the gym with 60 more pounds on your body, was it like totally new? Yeah. And it, it wasn't like, it wasn't fun. <laughs> it was kind of a, it kind of messed with me a little bit because you've done this thing for so long, you feel like you're really competent at it. And all of a sudden you're not. And relearning those movement patterns, once I kind of got the hang of it, it was like, oh, this is cool. Look, I can do this differently now. Yeah. But at first it was really, really difficult. And like I said, I still haven't completely figured out the deadlift. So let's talk about your peaks then. Okay, let's talk about your 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 highest deadlift and squat and bench when you were at your lightest. And then what are those numbers look like at your at your biggest? How close are they? Uh, so are they? at my lightest, so when I was yes, 181. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I squatted 760 in the gym at 181, but I think my best meat squat was 750 or 749, one of those. Um, my, uh, best squat now I've done, let's see, I did 730. So that was in wraps. I did 735, um, paws and sleeves. Cause I'm doing all these weird variations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, uh, a total of, I think it was 725 bar weight and another 135 chains. Um, and that was the wow. Sleeve, so not so that crazy. Not like you said, for, for someone who's got 15 more pounds exactly. of muscle yep. on his body, not that much more. No, definitely not. Wow. Um, my best deadlift at 181 was 782. I think it might have been 771. It was one of those. And um, my best deadlift, well, I pulled 855 now with straps. But without straps, I, I don't think I could do 782. Wow. Um, and my bench went up a lot. My bench best my best bench at 181 was 402, and I benched 484. Now, as we didn't go. We were going through most of your muscle groups, and you were kind of saying, and I want, actually, before Sal went on, I wanted to ask you if there was – anything related to the chest that you that you attribute to like as far as how you were training did you do something different whether it be dumbbell stuff or machine work what did you do for your chest i i will admit i love the smith machine for chest work ah. it's so nice because one of the things that you're doing in powerlifting is trying to really optimize your bar path and um, to make it as efficient as possible and with the bench press that means your the bar is going to kind of drift over your face right mm -hmm. as you press because that's going to help you get um it's going to help you utilize your triceps. Oh, more so you're saying as you're coming down, you're kind of, it's almost got this like yeah. arch to yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So training that way is really minimizing engagement of the pecs at the top. And I developed a really, really hard sticking point where if I wasn't in the perfect groove, there's no way in hell I was going to lock out that bench press. So being able to train in the Smith machine where it's a straight bar path really helped me develop the skill to push through that sticking point if I was a little bit out of the groove oh, because wow. I was more used to training my muscle in that position. Did you mess with like elbow flare and stuff on the regular bench press too? Did you do things like that? So I tried. It didn't help on the regular bench press, but it does help on the other movements, right? So if I'm pressing with dumbbells or I'm pressing with the Smith machine, that way I can engage my pecs a little bit more. It doesn't feel safe to me on a heavy bench press. Like the, the, the stretch on the pec under no. you know 450 plus it's not something i want to risk yeah try doing a guillotine press with heavy weight yeah. and you can really feel that in the upper chest but oh, if absolutely. you go heavy you're not gonna yeah. feel yeah, you're yeah. not gonna feel any weird exercises that you did that you've never tried before oh that's a good question let's see um weird exercises there have been a few um chris and i just the other day we were doing uh we're trying to do like a sissy leg press oh where you're you got your feet real low and real close yeah and and your hips really, come up off the pad yeah, yeah, so yeah. that was pretty cool um Let's see. What are some other good ones? We've done a lot of uh, weird supersets. Mm. Um, one that I uh, one that I really like is a mechanical drop set, where you're doing kind of a seated row and you start leaning way forward. Then when you fatigue there, you sit straight up. Oh, I see. And then see. you start leaning. So you back make the leverage again. easier as you go. Yeah. Oh, um, that's interesting. That type of stuff is really interesting to me. Um, but I don't know that there's anything that I've come up with other people wouldn't have seen or anything. What are some of the things that you, like, what do you think powerlifters could learn from bodybuilders and vice versa? So powerlifters, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I really think they need to be doing more isolation training. I think that um, whenever you're trying to address a weak range of motion in one of your lifts, there's almost always going to be a weak muscle group associated with that. Very similar to what I talked about with the Smith machine on the bench press. Yeah. And I think that if you're able to identify those connections, you're going to be a better powerlifter for that. Bodybuilders, I think they should really periodize their training more. We talked about how bodybuilding training is really simplistic and it's almost always some type of linear period, linear progression 
but if you're an advanced bodybuilder, how long is that going to be sustainable? Of course. How long are you going to be able to add 10 pounds to your leg press? Like, yeah, yeah. If you periodize your training, you're going to make progress for a lot longer in terms of strength, and eventually that is going to be manifested as size. Yeah, so going back to when you gained all that size in that short period of time, like, was it weird? Did, did it hurt? Like, what did it feel like? Because that's a very – the only time I think uh, most people ever experience that percentage of lean tissue growth is probably when they're babies or maybe even teenagers. So as a grown man gaining that much lean body mass in that short period of time – was it was a weird were you sleeping all the time was it, it like it was bizarre it was really <laughs> weird yeah um so yeah my sleep was a lot better uh, i think my energy levels throughout the day were better and that was you know probably because i wasn't starving myself um but it was extremely uncomfortable uh, like putting on shoes was really difficult going upstairs was really difficult and it just um you know even walking like if i was trying to go for a longer walk that was i'd get winded faster mm. And it was all completely new to me because I had been that size for my entire adult life, right? So um, it was really, really challenging to try to get used to it without um, getting emotionally attached to the way I used to feel. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, now, you had mentioned uh, bodybuilding. A lot of it relies on drugs and diet, whereas powerlifting relies on training. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to get into the drug aspect of, of professional of these professional yeah, sports. How different are they? So I, I've always read that powerlifter, I, I know there's certain anabolics that powerlifters favor because of their effect on aggression and strength and then bodybuilders like other kinds because of the size or whatever. Like what are the big differences that you see in the, in the drug use in the different sports? Um, well, yeah. So the first point I think bodybuilders, at least in the off season, you're trying to minimize the androgenic side effects you're getting as much as possible, right? Because to a large extent, the higher the dose, the more size you're going to put on. And if you're getting these, side, like you're getting a lot of aggression, you're getting a ton of acne, you're getting night sweats, you're getting insomnia, all things that typically are associated with some of the stronger androgens, you're not going to be able to make it that much progress as if you're recovering better or right? you're feeling better. So bodybuilders really try to minimize um, the the androgens in the off season. They're going to lean more towards the anabolics, going to put them more in size. So things like DECA, things like EQ, things mm -hmm. like Primo. Um, powerlifters want those androgens because typically the androgens are ones that are also going to have some effect on the central nervous system. They're going to result in better contractile output. They make uh, you stronger. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So for those, you know, you're going to have the compounds that would be typically associated with a bodybuilding meat prep or bodybuilding meat prep, bodybuilding show prep, right? So things like uh, Masteron, things like Trend, things like Halo, um, things like Anadrol, um, which I guess wouldn't really be in many bodybuilding show preps, but I've heard of it in a few. Um, but, and that, that's because they they give you a harder look to your physique. So bodybuilders will use it, and also there's a fat burning effect from the high androgens. Is that correct? That is, yeah. But I think powerlifters are specifically using it because, and I don't know the pharmacology enough to be able to explain this in detail, but those androgens tend to help your muscles work better, right? Because okay. you can gain strength through a, a, a number of different ways, right? You can make your muscle bigger. You can get better technique. Your central nervous system get more efficient. And steroids can help with all of those, maybe not the technique aspect, but some, mm. in some ways. Um, you can make an argument for like better neuro neurological learning, right? Um, so... The androgens will have a more of a direct effect on the power lifter success than the anabolics will. The other thing is, and you mentioned this earlier, the power lifters are trying to stay in a weight class for the most part, unless they're a super heavy guy. So they're going to be limited in the total milligrams they can use because, like I said earlier, typically a higher dose means bigger size. So if you're trying to stay, in my case, 198 or 181, you're not going to be able to use... 700 milligrams of testosterone because you're going to be outside of your weight class and if you're gaining size to add this strength and your goal is to compete well you're not going to be more competitive because you're going to be up against bigger guys who have that same advantage so sure. because of that is would you say in bodybuilding you see a lot <laughs> crazier do doses way higher doses oh wow like astronomically higher doses. oh wow yeah oh wow um, interesting I, I, what about in the unlimited weight classes and power things is it still Honestly, the the super heavy guys that I've talked to and work with, they tend to use some of the least amount of gear. Wow. Um, and I mean, I think that goes to the point where generally a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle, sure. right? So if you can put all that size without the gear, well, then you're still you're going to be just as strong, right? Mm -hmm. So they, at least from what I've heard, they don't they don't push the doses crazy hard. Um, it's more those lighter guys who are running you know high levels of drugs that aren't going to add much size. So you know using hundreds of milligrams of Anavar or, you know, 
lots of Halo or Tran or things like that. Yeah, uh, was it Halotestin? Is that you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, that's a very. I mean, uh, bodybuilders talk about that being a, like a waste of time. Like, oh yeah, you get stronger and aggressive. You don't really add any size. Powerlifters love it for that reason. Yep. You know, because they get that. Yeah. Any commonalities? Uh, is testosterone a commonality between the two? Just the dose is different. Yeah, for most people, I, I think everybody uses testosterone. I, I don't know. I don't know anybody personally. Well, I know one person who avoids testosterone completely, and he competes in powerlifting or used to. Um, but I think pretty much everybody uses testosterone because I mean, everybody has a life outside of competition, right? You don't want to give up the biological functions that testosterone is mm -hmm. going to provide. So what about growth hormone? Is that, I know that's a bodybuilding drug. Do powerlifters mess with growth hormone? Um, generally at, at least at the top levels, they're going to be running fairly low amounts, right? I don't know of anybody who runs more than about three IUs a day. Um, and I definitely wouldn't recommend it because the water retention in your hands you're going to get is really going to mess with your grip. You don't need more than that for recovery purposes, right? You're going to get the benefits from sleep, recovery joints, all that. You're going to get that from that low of a dose. So um, it's definitely beneficial to an extent, but it's a small extent. Well, you've now you've now had the opportunity to probably experiment with a lot of different uh, anabolics. Do you have um, favorites uh, and why and any least favorites and why? Um, yeah, so my philosophy now is to try to stay as much as possible in the anabolics that are, you know, have been tested in humans and approved for human use. Cause that's going to be safer. That's like three or four, I think, right? Yeah. There's yeah. not a whole lot. No. Um, so generally the safest one, safest compounds are going to be the bio bioidentical ones, right? The ones your body produces naturally. So testosterone growth hormone, um, you know, if you're talking about peptides, things like PPC, those are going to be safer than the synthetic ones as a general rule. Um, then, you know, if you're trying to add size, my go-to is always going to be Prima Bolin. It's probably the, you know, cleanest. That's a, a very vague term, but it's a very tissue selective. So mm -hmm. it's going to make your muscles bigger, but it's not going to have other types of side effects, right? That you might get from harsher androgens. Yeah, I read that was Arnold and uh, Franco's favorite drug back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. They, they brought Primo from Europe and that's what they would use over here while everybody else was using DECA. Yep, and the similar things to Primbon are going to be the other DHT derivatives, right? So we talked about Masteron, Anavar is another one. Um, those are going to be kind of the compounds that I would lean towards. They're going to be safer, and they're pro for the most part, you're going to get more or less the same benefits, milligram per milligram, that you would from other drugs. It might not be as fast, but you know, if you're just trying to rush things, well, you're not going to get the best results anyway. Yeah. yeah. Now, at some point, I think for bodybuilding. I don't know any bodybuilders who can get away, get on stage without using trend as harsh as it is. Like it gives you a look that other compounds seem not to mm. from, for powerlifting. I really don't like trend. I think that the, for me, it's insomnia, right? And when you're not able to sleep, you're not able to recover. You're not able to lift heavy weights. Like the training has to come first for powerlifting. Um, so uh, those are typically the ones that I kind of lean towards. I try to stay away from the ones that, um, either, you know, failed clinical trials, which there are a lot of them, uh, or the ones that, you know, have the, the kind of scarier long-term side effects, especially like the, the neurodegenerative issues, which, you know, it's not, we don't totally understand these drugs. It's not ethical to run studies where you're giving somebody hundreds and hundreds of milligrams mm -hmm. of, you know, Dianabol a day and seeing what happens over 10 years. But, um, you know, I try to err on the side of caution as much as Any possible. Any surprising effects? Like, uh, I remember the first time um, I experienced D balls, I was so blown away by the strength gains. It was like freakish. Every time I got to the gym to do shoulder press, I had to add 10 to 20 pounds to my lift, like every time. Uh, anything that like surprised you like that, that was like abnormally crazy? Um, the only one that sticks out to me like that is methyltran, which is one that, you know, I wouldn't recommend people use because it's not not really a very healthy drug. But, um, you know, I can take that a uh, small amount, like 500 micrograms, right? So half a milligram before training. And it's like, it feels like a cheat code, man. It feels like just anti-gravity. I didn't even know that existed. Is that a newer compound? Or? I don't really know um, the history of it, uh, but it is getting more pot. I mean, at this point in both sports, I think it's kind of an anything goes, mm -hmm. whatever you can get your hands on type deal. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I'm sure people are listening like, Oh my God, what about your health and all that stuff? And there's definitely, uh, I mean, let's be very clear, y you know, when you're looking at using anabolics in a medical setting, replacing hormones, there's, they're very healthy when you're using them outside of it. There's not a lot known. There's lots of risks, right? Potential, uh, health, uh, issues. And we see this in some pro bodybuilders, you know, what happens later on. 
Do you get monitored? Do you get your liver enzymes and kidneys checked and yep. all that stuff? Yeah, so I get blood work regularly. I've gotten, I've had my blood, so what is it, February? So I've had my blood work done three times in the past three months, right? So okay. I, I, get, oh, wow. I get pretty regular blood work. Um, and I consult with a doctor and all that to make sure that, you know, there's nothing, uh, definitely nothing that's going to be acutely concerning, right? Nothing short term, mm. but also nothing that, you know, looks like it would be a long term problem. If it is, it's something that we got to address, at least in the off season, right? If you're prepping for a competition for a short period of time, you got to do what you got to do. Now, what I haven't done and what I do need to do is get like heart scans because blood work can only tell you so much, right? And with you, you can pr get a pretty good feel of, okay, are my kidneys okay? Are my, is my liver okay? But when it comes to the heart, it's like you, you can get blood tests for your, to see what your heart is functioning at. But unless you get that scan, you don't really know. Anything. You don't know if it's grown. Exactly. Yeah. Cause that becomes an issue, right? Is the heart yep. growth. Um, and even some of the other tests that are, you know, looking at heart function, don't give the full story. Um, unless you get like an echocardiogram and EKG. Did you get any red flag? Have you had any red flags going through this? Because I mean, you gained so much muscle and you had changed the, your anabolic use. You talked about insomnia. I would imagine you would have seen some changes in the blood work that you had to address honestly since i've gotten bigger my blood work has been awesome it's been wow almost great. the only red flag i ever had was when i was trying to do those crazy cuts i think i mentioned this mm. my potassium was like elevated to scary levels and that was when it was like oh i gotta change something There's six um, bags of spinach yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow that's really interesting now let's go back to the insomnia um i also hear i mean putting up that much size look i've gained 15 pounds and I started snoring, which I haven't done in a long time. Did you get any like sleep apnea, any snoring yeah, issues? Yeah, yeah, I got really bad sleep apnea to the point. Oh man, this. So I forgot to mention this when you asked about adding all that size because I've had a CPAP now for oh, close to six months, I think. Mm. Um, and it's been night and day, but before that, dude i was scared to go to sleep because i would go to sleep and i would have dreams of like suffocating to death oh, oh my shit. god and i would wake up just like gasping for air and i'd be scared to go back to sleep i'd be like i don't i don't want to have that dream again it'd be like you're underwater and your lungs are filling up and you're gasping for air and trying to talk through yourself just calm down calm down and then you wake up and be like oh man that was scary <laughs> I, so I read a study on this. Do you know what they, they attribute that to? <coughs> the size, the, the growth of the muscle of the tongue and then the throat. So those muscles grow and then they kind of get in the way of breathing. So it's like, it's such a weird thing, right? Yeah, that was terrible. And the other thing that was terrible with sleep was the heartburn, which from what I've read is can be associated with sleep apnea. Mm. But there were points that I don't know if it was because I was putting down so much food, right? But like I would throw up in the middle of the night oh and just wake God. up. And, oh my oh, God. So mm. terrible. I remember one time I was supposed to have a cheat meal and that, like I wasn't hungry. I didn't want to eat anything. And I, I decided I could I could put down some Cheerios. So I have like a whole box of Cheerios and I <laughs> throw the Cheerios up in the middle of the night and it was all oh, just that sour <laughs> so, taste yeah. just stuck with you. I have not had Cheerios since then. It's been like three years. <laughs> yeah, there's, no, no, there's no side effects to getting that there's big gotta be, There's definitely people in our audience that are listening going like, what the fuck? This guy is crazy. Yeah, yeah, why? why would you do yeah, all of this to why yourself? Why push yourself to that limit? Yeah. I, well, it's it's really hard for me not to be competitive. It's like, I get my mind on a goal and the goal involves competition. It's like, I'm not going to stop yeah. until, I, until I get there. Yeah, you, I you, you most, you probably almost um, relish in the the, the challenge and these hurdles, right? It's, it's a like, lot if easier. If it was fucking easy, everybody could do it. Yes, it's <laughs> a lot easier for me to mentally deal with the fact that this is really hard and I really want to accomplish this and I got to figure out a way to do it than where I'm at now where it's like, what do I want to achieve, right? Trying to fit, answer that question is extremely difficult. Yeah, I had this conversation with a family member where they were, we were talking about this and like, why would anybody want to do something crazy like that? I said, you know what's funny? Nobody asks a professional football player that question or a drag racer that question, right? Like, they're just as crazy. It's just as dangerous, uh, especially if you look at, the, like, for example, pro football, it's an easy one. You look at their lifespan. They're, they're living to their 50-something, 60 years old. They're literally uh, hitting each other with the uh, the force of a small car collision every game. So it's not any crazier. It just sounds crazier, I think, because people are not. Uh, you know, they're not. There's not as many fans of well, bodybuilding. It's, not as, it's yeah. not as accepted. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. To the to the general population, it, it seems we're we're freaks or weird. It's different. And so you're right. That's a great point, though. Yeah. You're also not making the money. They are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's another question. That's I can't argue that. Exactly. You know what I mean? You live in your apartment. You barely can afford it. Why are you doing all this to yourself, Devin? Deal. So now, has this been good for your business to be able to change your? Because 
Uh, okay, I could see the benefit in lifting a lot of weight being light. That's like, wow, that's really impressive. But then there's the other side where social media, you know, it definitely rewards looking a particular way, especially if you look extreme. There's a certain amount, you know, type of fan that, oh my gosh, you know, he's so massive, he looks so crazy. Did it affect your business positively to make this transition? It absolutely did, but I actually think it did because I was reaching a new market as opposed to the people oh, that I, I was, tar you know, reaching mm -hmm. before really wanted to see this type of transformation. I think it's more just, just like people who were interested in bodybuilding before and now start following me, right? And now start asking me for advice. Do you get any hate? I was just going to ask that from the powerlifting community for leaving it to you. Or even the bodybuilding community for how dare you come into our sport and think you could do well. No, it's really, really funny. Uh, in powerlifting, I had a lot of haters, right? They were, my squat form really upset some people. I remember there was one comment, I can't remember if it was Instagram or YouTube, but somebody said my squat ruined his life. And I was like, well, <laughs> geez, dude, get a life. Um, but no, everybody from both sides, super, super supportive of bodybuilding, which was really, really cool to experience. Oh, that's, that's, that's really good to hear. Yeah. Cause you, cause you always think that there's going to be a little bit of you yeah. know, issues with, you know, one side versus. I other. mean, I definitely get people telling me, Oh, I want to see you come back to powerlifting. I want you to do a pro show. And, but it's always like yeah. good natured, right? Like they're encouraging. Now, what, now what do you think? What, cause I, earlier when you were talking about the weight that you can lift versus the size, right? People, I think sometimes have a tough time understanding, like you gain 60 pounds, but you can only lift another 15 pounds yep. on the bar or maybe none. Doesn't make sense. And we've explained this in other episodes that strength is more of a skill than anything. There's a lot of technique involved. It's very specific to the way you train. Bodybuilding is really about fatiguing a muscle and, and trying to minimize actually in, in some cases how much you can lift so that you can continue to build more. So it's very different. But now that you have the size, now that you've got all this extra muscle, if you went back to pure powerlifting to just see what you could do, what do you think what do you think that would that would land you? Okay, so if I were to go hundred percent in on powerlifting, let's say for the rest of my career. Yeah. The absolute upper ceiling I think would probably be somewhere around twenty three hundred, and I think probably more reasonable would be twenty two hundred total. Mm. So that would be best squat bench and deadlift. My best at one ninety eight was twenty thirty nine, right? So I would be 50 pounds heavier, lifting about 150 pounds more. So figure out about 50 pounds to each lift, which mm. is a pretty moderate amount. That would assume that, you know, 100% of my training is dedicated towards powerlifting. That total is going to be far, far, far less competitive than my 198 was. First of all, because powerlifting has grown a lot. And so you have a lot of new people with a lot of skill and a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of great genetics who are now competing at that level. And second of all, because the people who I was competing with before have this whole time that I've been bodybuilding, they've been working on their powerlifting. So they've gotten better. So from a competitive standpoint, compared to other people, I'd be way worse off. Just comparing against myself, I'd mm. be stronger, but maybe not as strong as you would expect having added all that. Stuff. Oh, I see. Now, it, from uh, like, if you had to train a particular way forever, now just to be healthy and fit, forget the 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 drug extremes, because then it's easy to make this comparison. But let's just say, you know. Yeah, training work, style. Yeah, training style for the rest of your life. Uh, which one do you think is more conducive to better longevity and quality of life? Oh, um, I honestly think it would be a combination. Yeah. I think it would be a good answer. Yeah, using some sort of you know typical powerlifting program, but not training for maximum weights. Mm. Training more with a typical bodybuilding kind of set and rep scheme. Yeah, you know what I'm finding is I get old. So I, I I've done both. I have fun doing both. Uh, I love strength. I love it. It's just fun. But I found that once I got now I'm 43 and I've gotten to a certain amount of weight for my body, which is a lot that I prefer now more bodybuilding because like to add more to the bar, the risk versus reward just isn't great anymore. You now, if yes. I had 10 more pounds, that's great and I'd be excited, uh, but I feel like my injury risk would be up too high. It just wouldn't make any sense. I completely agree. I just think that there's also a benefit to doing, you know, I think the full body training has a lot to, mm. a lot to be said for that. Um, so it's like, maybe you don't need to do a squat, but you can be doing a hack squat as your squat variation. And then you can be doing, you know, some type of heavy row, um, that you're doing on a bodybuilding style instead of doing a deadlift on a particular day. Yeah. Some type of pressing movement that's maybe not a straight bar bench press, but you know, maybe it's a press on the Smith machine. I think that type of training, at least for me, that would be more enjoyable and probably for that reason more productive um, than doing a typical body part. Style. I imagine that's got to be one of the, I mean, uh, fears you have of now getting this big and then going back to powerlifting is potentially injury because you were already at the peak to try and squeeze out a little bit more we've already talked about your movement patterns changing a little bit and then also thinking you're going to add weight to the bar uh, you, you a little fear around that absolutely and add age to that too right right, right yeah. so yeah absolutely there's definitely a a big risk um when you're trying to 
lift maximal weights no matter what the circumstances are. And I think the things that I've done in the past few years have only added to that risks. Yeah. Um, and the guys I've been, I, the guys I was was competing with when you know I was at my peak in powerlifting, uh, a lot of them have had to deal with that stuff, and they've done excellently in doing that. But I look at them and I'm like, man, what would I do in that situation? My friend uh, Andrew Herbert. He uh, he tore his adductor training for his last meet, and it was like a bad one where he needed surgery and stuff. And wow, um, you know it was on a 400 kilo squat, right, 881, mm. and you know so taking that type of weight, it's still like in sleeves, it's just like astronomical. Mm -hmm. But then I look at that, and I'm like, how would I cope with that injury right now? Like, yeah, yeah. Is that something I want to deal with? Yeah, yeah. Is there a, a power lifter and a and a bodybuilder that you're like really impressed with, or that you kind of keep an eye on of, on the, each category? Is there? Um, well, I mean, John Hack right now is doing just incredible things in powerlifting. It's really fun to watch. So, okay. Um, and he and I were competing together at a lot of meets uh, in 2016, 2017, 2018. So yeah, he's definitely, definitely the powerlifter that I, I look up to, uh, for bodybuilding. That's a tougher one for me. Um, cause, uh, I mean, there's the guys that I like to watch cause they're entertaining. Yeah. And then there's the guys I try to, I would want to emulate. Right. right? right. Look like and, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And honestly, the guys that I would want to emulate are the ones that are able to kind of step back from competition, able to have, you know, kind of, um, broader lives i guess you could say while still maintaining that sort of physique speaking of a lot broader lives and uh, we talked a little bit off air but you know what's uh what's in the future for you business wise what are you currently doing right now what's going on with that uh so right now i'm mostly focused on coaching i'm trying to get a little bit more into coaching nutrition for strength athletes because i do think that's an overlooked area where i could add some value um in terms of competition for myself, I want to do a pro show at some point. It's again, we've talked about the sacrifices you have to make to do that, but I want to know what it kind of feels like to get on a pro stage. Um, I still love powerlifting. My training partner competes in strongman, so that's something I would want to have fun with. Oh, I uh, saw you doing some strongman type stuff. Yeah, how's is, that? It's it's fun, man. It's a blast yeah. getting to move like that with heavy weights. It's really really cool. <laughs> um, but. Uh, in terms of like pushing myself to those same extremes, I'm not sure those are trade offs that I'm going to want to make forever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we were talking off air. Like, one of the goals I have for myself, I want to get on Joe Rogan at some point on his <laughs> podcast. I think that would be cool. That's a good and goal. I mean, it would be a good goal, but at the same time, it would take me, a, it would allow me to kind of push myself in ways that aren't directly physical, right? Yeah. So, and I think that's something that would be healthy and probably be fun for me as well. Well, I imagine that you're, you're back to the age thing, right? You're probably getting to an age now where you're starting to think like that. Okay, I recognize that. I need to have some crazy goals in my life, but they don't always have to probably be super physical. So trying to reframe that for yourself. It was funny. I was, uh, I was on a call with Dave Tate uh, a few months ago, I guess a couple months ago. And so he owns Elite FTS, one of the biggest powerlifting companies out there. And he's been a mentor of mine for a long time. And I'm talking about the same thing with him. And I'm saying, man, I want to do a pro show, but I'm getting older. It might be time to hang it up. And he cuts me off. He's like, You've been telling me that for at least five years. Just do the show. Yeah. <laughs> like, quit lying to yourself. That's hilarious. So. You know, going from from one strength sport or I guess resistance training, strength training type sport to another, um, it probably did it make you feel more open to other types of strength training. Like for, you know, you have powerlifting, you have bodybuilding style training, you have strongman style training. Then you have kind of the performance that you see in maybe some CrossFit style training or people who are more athletic minded. What I found personally, and this is how we write all of our programs is we find that, well, the average person is going to, there's something you can take from each one of them. And oftentimes people will get stuck in one, develop their camp and not even realize that there's benefits from, did it make you more open-minded to all this other, all these other ways of training? Absolutely. And it's funny because my graduate degree is in the history of physical culture, which is all types of training. <laughs> yeah. Right? So you'd think going to school for six years for it, you'd be open-minded to begin with, but no, it, until I started bodybuilding, I really like, I was very set in my ways. I was like, this is the way powerlifters train. This is how I want to train. I want to be a powerlifter. Yeah. And now it's, it's a lot broader. Have you tried any sled work? Oh yeah, I love sled. Oh yeah, so Absolutely. let's talk about that. So this yeah. that's something that no power lifter and no bodybuilder did for a long time. And now you're starting to see it permeate the strength sport. It was always like purely athletic. What what what, what benefits did you get from that? Um well, first of all, it's fun, right? Yeah. Second of all, you're you're getting some type of conditioning work in. And I think from the bodybuilding side, the benefits to that are obvious, yeah. right? From the powerlifting side, I think a lot of people go in with the idea that, oh, well, you know, I've squatted this in the gym and I've bench pressed this and I can deadlift this. So I can I can do that to me easy. And then they get to the meet and they realize by the time deadlifts roll around, they're exhausted. Mm. So including more conditioning work of that sort, it allows them to kind of build up their endurance in that regard, right? It's not the same type of endurance you would have running a 5K. You don't need to be able to do that, right. but you do need to have some gas in the tank 
yeah. you're going to be doing a long. Week. I noticed uh, a total like re- like it's got to be the lowest risk type resistance training. Like I didn't know I noticed my joints felt to- maybe because there's no eccentric portion of the rep, but I could drive a sled you know for 40 minutes and never have issues with my knees or my my hips. Did you notice anything like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll get crazy sore from it too. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And I think that has something to do with the lack of an eccentric portion mm-hmm. as well. I actually think um, my training partner and I were discussing this the other day. There's no real term for the lifts that you don't have to perform the eccentric on, right? Yes. Things like sled work, things like uh, deadlifts, you don't really have to perform, yeah. perform an eccentric. Uh, Olympic get, lifts. Yeah. Um, and even though those should probably never be the bread and butter of your hypertrophy training, I do think they have a place. 100%. Um, so we were trying to come up with a name for it. And if you guys watch Rick and Morty, the cartoon show. They have, I fucking love it. Yeah. You so, me? you know, they have the plumbus and nobody knows what a plumbus is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the plumbus part of the rep. The, the eccentric that you don't have to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So well, we're trying I think, to figure out how to work I think that it's in. more, it's less of the, you know, what it does for you and more of what it doesn't do to you and then how that allows you to program it. Like, it's yes. a great way to build Absolutely. volume without all the extra I can, Absolutely. I, yeah. I can drive a sled every day and, yeah. and not have too many negative effects on my recovery and my joints, whereas other exercise with eccentrics, I can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't so much. Have you messed around with isometrics or holds? Yes. What do you, what do you think yeah. about that? Um, I think... I like them. I think they can't be used in isolation. Back in the 70s, I think there was a big push for isometric yeah. training, and it got to the point where that would be all people would do, and right. they wouldn't see the same results. No. Now, that was also the time steroids were getting more popular, which right. helped isometric training kind sure. of get into vogue. But um, I definitely think there's a big, a lot to be said for isometric training, especially if you're incorporating it into your regular sort of training, right? Yeah. So if you're doing isometric holds at the top of every rep of leg extension, I think you're going to be a lot more out of that set because leg extensions are not the most demanding exercise. Mm-hmm. But if you're training your muscle to be comfortable in that position, yeah. uh, for lack of a better term, I think that has a lot of carryover for both size and strength. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You bring up isometrics and people, powerlifters or, or bodybuilders, the general typical one would be like, I don't know, I don't really want... But if you really look at their training, powerlifters use versions of isometrics all the time. They do pause squats, and they yep. they're always they're constantly changing the tempo of a lift to strengthen a particular, which is a form of isometrics. Yes. Bodybuilders pose, and pre-contest they will add thirty minutes, forty minutes, an hour of posing to their training, which is all isometric. So yep. the reality is they all do isometrics. They just don't even realize that they're, it's programmed that way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I love them. Absolutely. Very cool. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's great talking to you. I, I like too. seeing you succeed in this way. This is really well, cool. You. Get that kind of insight. So yeah, great yeah, being thanks, back here. thanks yeah, for yeah. coming on, man. Always good. Thanks seeing for having you. me. Always good seeing you, brother.